Teleequipment D-52 Service Scope, 1966-1969. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project, available in video and in written form, made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is also welcome and appreciated. This is a dual trace oscilloscope, especially advertised for the service market, in particular television servicing, that was built in the UK by Telequipment in the late 1960s. At that time, Telequipment had already been acquired by the American Tektronix, but it was kept as a separate brand. This oscilloscope was still marketed in 1969, also according to an advert appearing in the June 1969 issue of the magazine Electronic World. In Italy, where the item under restoration appeared, Telequipment oscilloscopes were imported by Silver Star Limited SPA. And here is an advert appearing in the October 1966 issue of the magazine Zantenna, where the model D-52 is mentioned. In fact, on the item under restoration, there is still a label of the importer. At the back of the cabinet, there is also an old inventory label that keeps the record of the original owner, the high school for Mo Corny of Mo Dinat, Italy. According to the account of its last owner who sold it on eBay, who had been formerly a student in that same school, this item appeared on a market stall where he decided to buy it. We assume that all previous transactions have been done correctly. The item arrived in relatively good condition. All original and only one bezel screw or bolt was missing. A lot of dust was inside, but that is part of the nature of a vacuum tube oscilloscope. The power switch was defective, but a contact cleaner brought it back to normal functionality. After cleaning the item, it became evident how difficult it would be separating the two boards from the chassis. Even the CRT seemed to be impossible to move from where it was. In the beginning, there was the temptation to just keep the oscilloscope as it was, hoping that the original colorful electrolytic capacitors would hold up. But later, the oscilloscope made it clear that there was a significant ripple in the B+, that was visibly affecting its ability to operate correctly. So a serious restoration plan was necessary. First of all, the original documentation. One should refer mainly to this document, Telequipment Oscilloscope Types D52 and S52. Among other sites, this document is available at the valvepage.com divided into two files. But there is an addendum that modifies the description of the attenuator, and also this extra file is necessary. During the restoration, the original schematics have been annotated and retouched, and all the data is available from the links appearing in the description. Also, a simplified representation of the two boards has been rewritten, including the most important components for the alignment and the connections to the CRT that are difficult to find in the original documentation. The following are some clips showing the process of restoration, starting from extracting the chassis out of the case.
This oscilloscope is very compact and the CRT anode voltage section is already on top of the chassis. Even if during the extraction of the chassis the oscilloscope is unplugged, there can always be residual charges in the capacitors and the chances of touching them involuntarily are too high. Using insulation gloves might reduce the risk of bad surprises. Behind the CRT socket there is a magnet that should remain where it is on the socket. Please notice that there are pins on that socket that are fed by a high negative voltage and some energy could have remained stored in the filter capacitor providing it. So using gloves also on this occasion would have been advisable. The CRT is contained in a metal shield that should be released from the chassis to be able to access the CRT itself. Before removing the CRT also the wires connecting the deflection plates should be detached and carefully put out of the way. Please keep in mind that some residual energy could have remained stored in the CRT anode voltage filter capacitor or even inside the CRT. So dealing with this CRT anode suction cup should always require some attention. The black tape that was installed by the factory was used because the CRT body is transparent and, where not obscured by the metal shield, the light could enter from behind, reducing the visibility of the displayed traces. At this point, some of the large electrolytic capacitors have been removed, and new ones are going to be installed. However, they are soldered from the component side because it is easier and because it would make removing them easier in the future.
While doing so, one should also protect the components that are located under the board to avoid splashing them with the tin that would fall from the large holes. Even though the soldering is done on the component side, it is necessary to verify that underneath everything is okay too. At this point, some electrolytic capacitors were still original because new ones were not available yet. However, it was about time to verify if everything was still working. So, after having cleaned the CRT and the metal shield, with new felt applied they are installed again, but at the moment without concern about the orientation, and also ignoring the magnet at the bottom of the CRT socket. The adhesive felt that is applied to the CRT should not be too much otherwise the shield would not stay at the desired position and the CRT would not be able to enter into its correct location. Here, the felt ring is moved back a little bit, and some captain tape is put on the most external part instead.
Now the CRT seats correctly at the front. All the connections on the neck of the CRT, six deflection plates and one shield, should be carefully reattached. As already mentioned, at the moment the magnet at the bottom of the CRT socket is not installed. The oscilloscope is then tested, and the result seems to be comforting, even though the planned capacitor replacement is not finished yet. As expected, the traces are tilted, because the CRT is not oriented correctly. Later, when the CRT will be reinstalled definitely, with the help of some masking tape, it will be possible to mark an horizontal reference on the screen, parallel to the actual trace, so that it could be aligned after turning off the oscilloscope. Finally, when the missing components arrived, the process could be completed, replacing the last electrolytic capacitors the CRT anode voltage filter capacitors, and the selenium rectifiers. The selenium rectifiers have been restuffed with high voltage silicon diodes. The Type 2 CL72 has been used because it can stand 10 kV and a current of 5 mA. The CRT anode voltage filter capacitors have been fixed on the board using nylon zip ties because they would not have fit in the original metal brackets. Up to this point, the power cord had been left loose. To secure it to the chassis, a creative solution has been tried because a grommet of the right size was not available. A grommet that was able to hold tight to the cord was inserted first. Then, a piece of heat shrink pipe was inserted. Outside of the chassis, another tight grommet was inserted, pushing back the heat shrink pipe. The original idea was to let the heat shrink pipe pass inside the grommet, but that could not work. Then the grommets, the wrinkled heat shrink pipe, and the cord have been glued using super glue, with the result that now the power cord cannot be pulled, pushed nor turned. One last look at the casualties before going further. This oscilloscope uses screws of different standards. Metric, UNC, and something else that probably is UNF. If one wanted to replace screws or bolts on this oscilloscope, that could become complicated. Only by chance, 
I had something that could replace the missing bezel screw. The full adjustment of this instrument is a serious business, which luckily is extensively described in the original documentation mentioned at the beginning of this video. However, what is not written is the recommended sequence of adjustments to achieve, relying on the fact that the oscilloscope was already initially prepared by the factory. Despite the optimism expressed in the original documentation, due to the complex interdependence between the different parts of the circuit, replacing a component or even swapping two tubes of the same type, might bring the instrument to a significantly different operating point. However, with the expectation of bringing the instrument back to its original technological shine much more than just the electrolytic capacitors should have been changed, which under the structural circumstances of this oscilloscope is not viable, the printed circuit boards are very fragile. They cannot be separated from the body of the chassis without creating more damage. There are components that are irreplaceable, like the potentiometers and the switches. Therefore, instead of aiming for perfection, the adjustments done for this restoration are intended simply to get a reasonable usability. Anyhow, please refer to the original documentation or to the written documentation that comes along with this video for the full list of adjustments. On the main board near the CRT anode voltage area, there is the trimmer RV300 marked as set IK. This is responsible for setting the maximum CRT cathode current. According to the CRT specifications of the model 55451, this current should not be higher than 0.3 mA in continuous mode or 0.5 mA intermittently. The original documentation prescribes to set this trimmer measuring the voltage across resistor R313, which should have a value of 1 kilo ohm, and therefore the measured voltage should not be higher than 0.5 volts when the brightness is set to maximum. While doing this adjustment, the traces should be projected outside the surface of the screen phosphor to avoid damaging it at full brightness. It must also be taken into serious account that the voltmeter should have a relatively high impedance. It must be completely isolated because around resistor R313 there is about minus 900 volts compared to the chassis. If the value of the resistor R313 is not exactly 1 kilo ohms, a different calculation should be made. In this case, with an actual value of 1260 ohms, the max voltage across it has been set to a slightly higher value than 0.5 volts. This adjustment must be done with attention to the CRT anode voltage area and a fully isolated screwdriver, plastic or ceramic, is mandatory. If the maximum brightness of the oscilloscope is too bright or too dim, the trimmer RV307 located on the main board very close to one terminal of the CRT anode voltage rectifier MR408 could be used to adjust it. There are circumstances in which after adjusting the trimmer RV307 using the brightness control at the front panel would change the trace length. If this is the case the trimmer RV307 must be adjusted differently until the undesired effect disappears. This adjustment should be done while keeping connected the voltmeter across R313 to verify that the cathode current would not exceed a safe value. And again, a fully isolated screwdriver is mandatory. While on the screen a square wave is represented and focused at the best with the control on the front panel, adjusting the trimmer RV311 might bring to a better visual result. Please remember that the area of the trimmer RV311 contains CRT anode voltage and a fully isolated screwdriver is mandatory. While visualizing two traces on the screen, if the brightness of them is significantly different, 
the magnet at the bottom of the CRT socket could be rotated to make them as equal as possible. A plastic square tool is necessary for doing the job. In this case, not having a specific tool of the right size, the stem of a small brush has been adapted for the purpose. But, to be able to turn the magnet, also the ring holding together the magnet between the two brackets had to be removed. Later, to avoid damaging the magnet instead of the original ring, a nylon zip tie has been put in place. The vertical section of the oscilloscope, for each input signal, has an amplifier that, if activated, should extend the amplitude of the visualized waveform by a factor of 10. The trimmers RV38 are used to adjust this amplification factor to exactly 10 times. Please notice that they should be accessed from underneath the printed circuit board. It is sufficient to feed the desired test wave to both Y inputs, initially visualizing it without the amplification and using an attenuation of 1 volt per centimeter. Obviously, the input signal should have an amplitude that could allow comfortable visualization on the screen. Then, selecting an attenuation of 10 volts per centimeter and activating the internal X10 amplifier, the trimmers are V38 corresponding to each Y input should be adjusted to obtain the same vertical extension as before. The most important adjustments for this oscilloscope have been made accessible from the front panel. The trimmer RV23 duplicated for the two Y inputs allows to modify the vertical extension of a wave on the screen. Using a known wave reference, for example from a reliable function generator, the wave should occupy vertically the expected extension according to the chosen attenuation level. This calibration is done only with one chosen attenuation because then it should be valid for all the others. The potentiometers are V33, responsible for shifting the vertical position of traces on the screen, should always be in the condition of placing the traces at any desired level, also outside the visible screen. Ideally, when a trace is centered on the screen, changing to X10 and back to X1, should not move the trace from its vertical location. Theoretically, the trimmers are V31 should allow to reach this ideal result. However, it might be impossible, and probably it would be necessary to set the Y plate potential to solve the problem. See section 2.6 of chapter 6 in the original documentation. During the restoration, the adjustment of the Y plate potential has not been done and initially it was not even possible to visualize the traces in all the combinations of X1 and X10. This problem was solved trying different permutations of the tubes in the vertical amplifier board and no further investigation was done. When the potentiometer RV284 variable is set to maximum and the potentiometer RV168 X gain is set to minimum, the selected position on the rotary switch time per centimeter should represent the exact horizontal width of the trace in that particular interval of time. For example, selecting 5 milliseconds per centimeter means that the horizontal space of 1 centimeter should be traversed in 5 milliseconds. Following the example, if a wave of 50 hertz were represented, one cycle of this wave would occupy 4 centimeters because it would take exactly 20 milliseconds, 4 times 5 milliseconds. With the help of a reliable function generator, choosing a comfortable value on the time per centimeter switch, the trimmer RV167 could be adjusted to get the expected width of a wave cycle on the screen. During the adjustment procedure, the trimmer resistors often appeared very touchy, making it difficult to get exactly to the desired functioning point. If I had to restore another telequipment oscilloscope, 
I would also consider replacing the accessible trimmer resistors with multi-turn equivalents. A Telequipment D52 oscilloscope is ready. The function generator is configured for two sine waves having an amplitude of 1 volt peak peak. Initially, the first signal has a frequency of 1000 Hz, while the second on purpose 1001 Hz. This allows to see the difference when synchronizing the horizontal sweep with one input or the other. The trigger selector has been left in the normal position. Playing with the focus. To stabilize the wave on the screen, it is always necessary some adjustment with the variable horizontal speed. Playing with the two vertical sections. Vertical shift, vertical attenuation and vertical amplification. If the resulting signal that is used for triggering is too attenuated, the trigger would fail to synchronize the horizontal sweep. The signal generator is now configured for sending 1 MHz to the first vertical input of the oscilloscope. Now, 6 MHz are sent to the second vertical input. The result appears significantly attenuated. The only way to see the 6 MHz signal is to stretch the horizontal sweep, increasing the horizontal gain. The frequency of the two signals is changed again. The first vertical section is fed with 10,000 Hz, while the second is fed with 10,001 Hz. The vertical amplitude remains 1 volt peak to peak. The function generator is now configured to provide different waveforms while the trigger is obtained from the vertical section still receiving a regular sine wave.
Both sine waves now have the exact same frequency. If you would like to contribute to this project, donating old electronics equipment or old radios in whatever condition they might be, provided that you do not feel any attachment that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation and video production.